My name is Jason Fries. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at the Mobileye Center. Today we'll be talking about rapid biomedical knowledge base construction from unstructured data using a tool called Snorkel that we're building here at Stanford. To give you an idea of today's agenda, we'll begin by introducing labeling functions. Uh, these are sort of the heart of using Snorkel. We'll discuss certain types of labeling functions, how we can evaluate their performance, and how we interact with the Snorkel API to do all of this. Then we'll move into the generative model. This is the way in which we unify the supervision provided by labeling functions to actually generate programmatically large-scale training data sets. Then we'll go into the discriminative model, where you can think of, uh, which you can think of as compiling labeling functions or rules into features using your favorite deep learning models. And then finally, we'll go into application development where we talk about ideas about schemas and evaluation plans and how you can use this to build your own snorkel application. And we'll round up the day with a welcome reception. First, let's discuss a little terminology that I'll talk about throughout the day. Um, this is common lingo in information extraction. Uh, first is the concept of an entity, which is simply any concept that can be separated into meaningful categories for text. These are uh, intuitive concepts like a person's name, or a geographic place, or a company name. And what we're really interested in with a tool like Snorkel is identifying relationships between these entities as expressed in text. So our running example uh, during today's uh, session will be the spouse relation, which is simply a semantic connection between two person entities uh, expressed within uh, the confines of a single sentence. And the reason we care about all of this is that we want to be able to extract information from large-scale collections of unstructured data to populate into what's called a knowledge base. And this is quite simply a database of facts, um, and it really forms the output artifact of a tool like Snorkel that we can then use for downstream uh, analysis tasks. So let's imagine for a moment that the entertainment news website TMZ has approached you and asks you to build a state-of-the-art text mining system for tracking celebrity marriage gossip. And you, being a top-notch, if somewhat mercenary, data scientist, immediately recognize this as a relation extraction task. To be more formal, uh, your task is to build a knowledge base of married couples by extra extracting mentions of spouses from news articles, where here a spouse is simply a pair of people mentioned in the sentence, in which we know that that pair of people are married. If you were to approach this in the traditional machine learning way, you begin by manually labeling a bunch of data. You then go about tediously designing uh, features that would help you uh, uh, train a model, uh, which would then, of course, be the final task you do to build your classifier. And as Steven did a really good job of going over in his introductory talk, these first two steps require non-trivial engineering effort. And for uh, the middle task of manually designing features, one of the real big appeals about deep learning is that it's killed fe uh, manual feature engineering. Uh, but that benefit comes with a pretty substantial cost, and that in order to get rid of feature engineering, we need a huge amount of labeled data. And in the current way of thinking, there, there isn't way, any way really around that. So we just have to sit down and hundreds or perhaps thousands of times have humans go and generate training data for us. And this bottleneck is really what informs the entire idea behind Snorkel and data programming, where the key intuition is that instead of manually labeling data, we can write heuristics to programmatically label data. And what this allows us to do is capture some of the structure of annotation but scale it up to arbitrarily large collections of uh, training data. This idea uh, we call labeling functions. And so now we'll go about building some intuition on what these actually encode and what kind of intuitions we can build into them. So to start, uh, let's say you had this sentence. And I asked you as an annotator to tell me if this were a true or false example of a married couple and assume that I've already annotated the names Rachel and Graham for you. What clues could you imagine uh, finding in this text to help you make that decision? 
And some of the most important evidence is just found in the words in between the names. In this case, and her husband is a pretty good clue that these, uh, this pair of people are actually married. If we use another example uh, involving the Obamas, what information would you use here to be able to uh, make a true or false uh, label judgment? This is interesting because we can imagine using the information that this is talking about the president, and we know that the president's wife is always referred to as the first lady, uh, but this is all sort of information that we know from external common sense rules. But it's enough to know that that's where the clues are, and that's what we would use to make our labeling decision. And this gets to the heart of what a labeling function does, is that human annotators leverage all kinds of real world knowledge, information about context, uh, and other common sense heuristics to make their decisions. And this isn't a random process. Uh, there are parts of this that we can model and encode using rules as functions. And with that, a labeling function is formally a black box function that labels subsets of data. And in this case, our label space is negative 1, 0, 1, which maps to negative, abstain, which means decline to vote, or positive. What do labeling functions uh, uh, vote over? In this case, we call them candidates which are simply all pairs of people's names in a sentence. Again, using our running example of spouses. So you can see here we have a sentence and we have the pair of names for the Obamas and that represents a spouse relation. So the important thing to know about candidates is that they can include both true and false instances. So if you look here in sentence ID 1 um, with Jeffrey and Jeanette, that is a true instance of a uh, married couple while sentence two with Khloe uh, Kardashian is in fact not a true instance of the married relation. So the, the goal of labeling functions here is to provide potentially weak correlated signal with the true class labels. And we do that by writing labeling functions and applying them all candidates. And the, a, a very important detail to know is that these labeling functions should predict both positive and negative labels. So you need to provide signal for both polarities. What does that mean? Well, let's say we had uh, uh, another sentence that talks again about the Obamas. You might see that uh, a good intuition that correlates with the true label is that people with the same last name might be married. That isn't true all the time, but you know some percentage of the time, it's a pretty good clue that you're talking about a married couple. Conversely, for a negative signal, you might see that if boyfriend or girlfriend occur between the uh, mentions of people's names, that's a good clue that the pair in question is in fact not married. And these intuitions and anything else you can think of can pretty easily be encoded as Python functions, which allow us to apply these insights at scale to a large candidate set. And the key advantage of thinking in these terms, at least in terms of snorkel, is that labeling functions can be noisy, right? People with the same last name might not, might be married, but they might not be. So there is a latent accuracy associated with all of these rules you make. So again, just to make this more concrete, uh, in the Obamas, they share the last name, so a labeling function that uses that information to predict true would be right. But for uh, siblings uh, who share the same last name, of course, it's going to be wrong. And then in some cases, we'll have married uh, couples that don't share the same last name, in which case, you know, we could have our uh, labeling function abstain to vote. So now we'll go briefly over some design strategies for building labeling functions. So the, previously, when we talked about how to write labeling functions, you, you notice that we used a lot of text-based patterns or keywords to clue us in on what we should, uh, how we should predict a label. And in this case, we saw that the words that occur between people's names are in fact very predictive 
of uh, or a good place to find predictive clues of whether or not a relation is true or not. These are all called pattern-based labeling functions. And this is a uh, very powerful uh, way to design labeling functions. Usually we implement these using string matching or via regular expressions. We can, of course, use other heuristics. Um, but at the heart, it's really just pattern matching to strings. But this isn't the only source of information we can use to generate labeling functions. Another really common uh, technique in text mining is to use what's called distance supervision. And distance supervision uh, leverages existing structured resources like databases to generate a set, a set of known facts that we can use to noisily label data. What does that mean? Well, let's say we had a database that contains a bunch of married couples' names. We could write a labeling function, here just called known spouse, that simply looks at the arguments, the people's names, in a sentence, and checks to see if they're found in the knowledge base. If they're found in the knowledge base, this labeling function would predict true. And if it's not found in the labeling, uh, not found in the knowledge base, the label would be false. And the advantage of this approach, especially in the biomedical domain, is that there are many, many public ontologies and structured vocabularies and resources of knowledge that we could conceive of using to distantly supervise our uh, our extraction task. So today, when we walk through our uh, tutorials and examples, we'll be relying on the DBpedia knowledge base, which provides a uh, small set of known married couples that we'll use as an example for distance supervision, uh, again, in our tutorial. So now we'll discuss briefly uh, how we actually assess or score labeling functions. So that's a big question, is we've written a bunch of labeling functions. Uh, how do we know if they're good or not? Well, we rely on three primary metrics as we're designing labeling functions. The first one is accuracy, which is simply the percentage of candidates that a labeling function uh, gets correct. We can think in terms of coverage, which is the percentage of all candidates that are labeled by at least one labeling function. And then this other interesting idea is of conflict, which is the percentage of candidates where one or more, where, where greater than one labels disagree. And this is important because while this sounds bad, Snorkel is actually capable of, of leveraging this information to learn a better model. Uh, and we'll get into the more details of how that actually works when we discuss the generative model later today. And of course, assessing empirical accuracy always requires some ground truth labels. So in the motivating spouse example we'll go through today, we've actually provided a small set of labeled, of human labeled data that we can use to guide labeling function development. And in general, for labeling functions, we would want high coverage, high accuracy LFs, or labeling functions. Um, and these labeling functions should label with a probability better than random chance. And as I said, conflict in this context is actually good because it allows our generative model to learn information about the labeling function, which tells us about how much, uh, how it tells us about its latent accuracy uh, factor, and it tells us how much we should trust that labeling function. Finally, some more to uh, terminology to introduce. These are standard information retrieval, text mining metrics. The first is precision, which is simply how often a predicted label is correct. The second is recall. It's the, uh, given the total number of positive instances, how many have we labeled correctly? And then finally, F1 score, which is just the harmonic mean of precision and recall.